Welcome to CNU, the video series that will teach you everything you need to know to provide excellent nutrition care. In this video, I'm going to talk about the indications for a postpyloric feeding tube. By the end of the video, you should be able to understand when a postpyloric feeding tube may be used and provide guidance on steps to minimize risk for aspiration and improve tolerance to tube feeding. If you find this video helpful, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Let's get started. I want to begin by reinforcing that gastric feeding is used as the first line therapy in most medical institutions, meaning it is the treatment method that is preferred. There are a few reasons for this. For one, feeding into the stomach aligns with the normal digestive process allowing formula to mix with gastric juices prior to being released into the small intestine for absorption. This helps to maintain the stomach structure and function. Another reason the stomach is preferred, especially when it comes to short-term feeding tubes, is that it's easier to position the tube there. A variety of staff members can be trained to place a nasogastric or orogastric tube at the bedside, which can reduce delays in feeding. It is also the more cost-effective option because it does not require an endoscope or fluoroscope. Postpyloric feeding is used when gastric feeding is unsafe or poorly tolerated. I have identified four situations that can lead to postpyloric feeding. This includes when a patient is determined to be at high risk for aspiration, when a patient has gastroparesis, when the patient's anatomy does not allow for gastric feeding, and when there is a mechanical obstruction of the stomach or duodenum. Let's take a closer look at each of these. Aspiration is characterized by the undesirable entry of an object or substance into the lungs. In the context of tube feeding, it comes down to the regurgitation of formula from the stomach into the esophagus and airway. Aspiration can be deadly for obvious reasons like choking. However, it is also dangerous because even a minor case can contribute to the development of aspiration pneumonia, which can progress to respiratory failure or sepsis and can be fatal. Postpyloric feeding has been shown to decrease the incidence of aspiration. For this reason, there are some institutions that have made it the standard for any patient who is determined to be at high risk. This includes, but is not limited to, patients who are unable to protect their airway due to mechanical ventilation and patients with neurologic deficits like a poor gag reflex and poor muscle control. Still, it is important to keep in mind that patients can aspirate on a substance that is not formula or gastric contents, such as contaminated secretions from the nose and mouth. Therefore, postpyloric feeds can decrease risk for aspiration, but will not eliminate risk for aspiration altogether. Gastroparesis is when there is delayed emptying of food from the stomach into the small intestine. This condition results in persistent nausea and abdominal pain after meals, as well as frequent vomiting. Gastroparesis is a common complication for patients with uncontrolled diabetes because high blood sugar can result in permanent nerve damage in the stomach. It can also present as a complication from a viral or bacterial infection even long after the infection is resolved. Some other causes that are not listed here are neurological disease, low blood potassium, and after surgery. Patients with gastroparesis often experience poor tolerance to gastric feeding, but find relief with a postpyloric feeding tube. This enhances quality of life and nutrient delivery while reducing risk for vomiting and aspiration. 
When considering anatomy, a postpyloric feeding tube is usually needed due to a history of surgery to the upper gastrointestinal tract. This includes surgical resection of the esophagus, stomach, and duodenum. In my professional experience, I see this happen most often when there is cancer of the stomach and esophagus, resulting in the need for a gastrectomy or esophagectomy, respectively, and complications from bariatric surgery, both with the Ruin Y gastric bypass and the sleeve gastrectomy. With some surgeries of the upper gastrointestinal tract, as would be the case with a total gastrectomy, the patient will be left without a stomach, making postpyloric feeds a necessity. With others, such as a partial gastrectomy, the patient will be left with a very small reservoir to hold formula, putting them at a high risk for aspiration and poor tolerance. Finally, with mechanical obstruction, formula cannot pass through the stomach because an object is blocking the way. This is often referred to as a gastric outlet obstruction and can be categorized as malignant or benign. For malignant, we have cancer of the stomach and duodenum. For benign, we have conditions like peptic ulcer disease, which can result in a significant buildup of scar tissue, chronic pancreatitis, where the inflamed pancreas compresses the surrounding organs, and gastric bazaar, which is a collection of indigestible material like dietary fiber or hair. In any case, if a patient is going to receive enteral nutrition with a gastric outlet obstruction, placing a postpyloric feeding tube is the only choice. If enteral nutrition has been determined to be too risky, the patient may be maintained on parenteral nutrition until the issue is resolved. When attempting to reduce risk for aspiration and minimize the negative effects of gastroparesis, the advantage of a postpyloric feeding tube makes sense from a purely anatomical perspective. The further the end of the tube is positioned from the airway, the less likely the formula is to end up there and the more likely it is to be absorbed. However, if a patient is determined to be at a high risk for aspiration, or has gastroparesis, it does not always mean a postpyloric feeding tube is going to be placed. In many instances, the patient will receive a gastric feeding tube first and be assessed for tolerance. When this happens, steps must be taken to reduce risk for aspiration and promote tolerance to tube feeding. Here, a responsible clinician will Elevate the head of bed to 30 to 45 degrees. This is because the more upright the patient, the less likely formula is to be regurgitated into the esophagus or airway. Choose a continuous feeding method, since the continuous feeding method is more likely to be tolerated than the bolus and intermittent feeding methods. Consider a prokinetic agent, because these medications can improve gastric emptying and monitor the patient closely. It is a good idea to check for signs and symptoms of intolerances at least every four hours when tube feeding is first initiated. Patients should be assessed for abdominal distension and vomiting, and if verbal or nonverbal feedback can be obtained, feelings of fullness, discomfort, and nausea should be assessed as well. If all of these precautions are taken and the patient tolerates the feeds well, then the feeding tube can remain in the stomach. If all of these precautions are taken and the patient develops poor tolerance, the feeding tube should be advanced to the small intestine. Here is a summary for this lesson. When we think about when a postpyloric feeding tube should be used, it is important to note that gastric feeding is used as the first-line therapy in most medical institutions. This is because it aligns with the normal digestive process and is easier to place at the bedside. 
A postpyloric feeding tube is used when gastric feeding is unsafe or poorly tolerated. This includes a high risk for aspiration, like when a patient is with mechanical ventilation or neurologic deficits. Patients with gastroparesis, which can be a complication of diabetes, infection, and surgery. When there are changes to the patient's anatomy, like with an esophagectomy, gastrectomy, and bariatric surgery. And when there is a mechanical obstruction, which can occur from peptic ulcer disease, pancreatitis, and a bazaar. Nevertheless, just because a patient is at a high risk for aspiration or has gastroparesis, it does not always mean a postpyloric feeding tube is going to be placed. In many instances, the patient will receive a gastric feeding tube first and be assessed for tolerance. When this happens, steps must be taken to reduce the risk for aspiration and promote tolerance to tube feeding. A responsible clinician will elevate the head of bed to 30 to 45 degrees, choose a continuous feeding method, consider a prokinetic agent to enhance gastric emptying, and monitor closely for signs and symptoms of intolerances like abdominal distension and vomiting. If these steps are taken and the patient tolerates the feeds well, then the feeding tube can remain in the stomach. If these steps are taken and the patient develops poor tolerance, the feeding tube should be advanced to the small intestine. Thank you for watching. Check out these videos for more content just like this.